uh, Eve Engler, and uh, we're going to be talking about this um, uh, Nazi gate in Parliament, where uh, the House of Commons uh, recently, during the uh, uh, visit of uh, Ukrainian uh, President uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, they gave a two unanimous uh, or two uh, standing ovations to a uh, former SS uh, soldier, uh, Yaroslav Hanka. Now, this, uh, despite how the media is presenting it, this to me is largely an outgrowth of Canada's uh, uh, both staunch support for NATO, uh, as well as deep ties to far right uh, Ukrainian nationalism, longstanding historic ties. And the, in the media coverage so far, even though the the uh, Honka was celebrated uh, for his role in, in fighting Russia during World War II, both in the House of Commons and in the parliamentary speaker's uh, justification afterwards, none of the media have actually looked into uh, what um, the Nazis did in Russia in, in during World War II, which was absolutely horrific. There was, you know... 20 million or so uh, Russians killed, uh, incredibly brutal uh, 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 actions. So this, um, this incident, the Nazigate incident, has a much broader uh, uh, foreign policy implications than it being uh, discussed in, 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 uh, in the dominant media. And I think it may lead to somewhat of an unraveling of the unanimity of public support or unanimity, should I say, of, 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 of uh, parliamentary support uh, from the Greens, NDP, to the Bloc Québécois, Liberals and Conservatives uh, in terms of Canadian policy. Uh, we will see. Uh, there are upcoming uh, uh, protests uh, in, in next week in across uh, Canadian cities to put pressure on the Canadian government to to uh, uh, push for negotiations uh, to end this uh, this uh, proxy war, um, but I thought that um, a, I would invite um, Richard Sanders to give us some background on uh, uh, the uh, uh, Nazigate scandal. Um, because uh, Sanders, who uh, uh, a longtime uh, leader of the coalition to oppose the arms trade, um, published in um, uh, spring 2021 a very important uh, historical uh, 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 report on this question titled Cold War Canada, Ongoing State Support for East European emigre groups with deep fascist roots. So this is not an issue that just sort of appeared uh, in the House of Commons a week ago. Uh, there's a long history here. And I thought I would invite um, uh, uh, Richard on to, uh, to discuss the matter. Thanks a lot for, uh, for coming on, uh, Richard. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on there, on your show. So, so uh, Yaroslav Honka was uh, vol volunteered by his own admission for the uh, 14th uh, Waffen SS. Um, he was given a, a st double standing ovation in the House of Commons. There's um, there's images of uh, Wayne Ears, the head of the chief of the defense staff, the head of the Canadian military, sitting three seats over, or four seats over from Honka. Um, uh, standing and clapping, and w Wayne Ears has not apologized. Uh, others, uh, most of the MPs, have apologized. Uh, also, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress seems to have been silent. I have not been able to find any comment uh, by the Ukrainian Canadian Congress on this issue. We know that Honka was a um, uh, was was given an honor by the UCC apparently back in two thousand seven. He's been donating annually to the UCC uh, uh, more than $5,000 over the past uh, six or seven years. Um, we also know that Honka uh, had an endowment. He gave $30,000 to the Ukrainian Studies uh, program at University of Alberta um, uh, and, and had an endowment under his name, which the University of Alberta has now uh, uh, rescinded. Um, so, so this is not just some sort of random individual that, you know, one day the parliamentary speaker just sort of, you know, bumped into in the street and said, hey, why don't you come and uh, I'll set you at the in the House of Commons. This is somebody who clearly has roots, ties to uh, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and um, a certain element of the Ukrainian Canadian uh, uh, community. And so 
so Richard, can you give us like a bit of a background of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, a little bit of a background on um, the the uh, support for East, East European emigrate groups with deep fascist roots, as your report is uh, titled? Yeah. Um, well, I, I I would like to do that, sure, uh, because that's being completely ignored by the mainstream media. They, they're they not talk, putting this in the broader context at all. And uh, from what I can see, the media is uh, basically covering up this really long history of Canadian government support for uh, not only just Ukrainian uh, communities that organizations that... Uh, are glorifying still to this day uh, their fascist heroes from World War II. Uh, but uh, the government is, is, you know, continuing to give uh, money for their monuments, for their community associations, for their publications, for their events, for their programs. And uh, this is being completely ignored. Um, it's very little known. In fact, I don't think the media has ever done really much of a story on that, uh, on those issues. Um, and this would be a great opportunity. I think eventually it'll come out. I think this this sto story will broaden beyond Hunka. But at this point, at the Hunka Gate, uh, it's kind of uh, really obscuring uh, the um, the broader issues. So, but one of the things that I want to point out is that. Um, when he, when the uh, Speaker of the House introduced Hanka, he referred to him as a hero, a, a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, who had fought in the, quote, struggle for independence against the Russians in the Second World War. So I think that the MPs who then immediately jumped to their feet and applauded and were so happy to see this guy and, and to re uh, recognize him as a hero um, had no excuse whatsoever because surely they must know that the Soviet Union of which Russia was the, the strongest uh, biggest part um, that it was the main foe of Hitler and the Nazis and uh, yeah like maybe 20 million Russians died, but 27 million Soviets died of all nationalities. It was a really multicultural, multi-ethnic, multinational uh, country. Uh, and this was, uh, you know, anathema to the fascist view of things, which was you want to have ethnic cleansing, like the Ukrainian fascists and the German fascists, the Nazis, had us so much in common, you know, the white supremacy, the uh, hatred of, of uh, communism was probably the most prominent feature of them, of their, uh, of them. Uh, they hated Poles, they hated uh, any other ethnic groups, and they wanted to wipe out, they wanted to ethnically cleanse. Um, but so they have no excuse for having jumping to their feet and applauding. And the, the other thing is, he says, the speaker said, the struggle for independence. Well, the Waffen-SS uh, was not struggling for Ukrainian independence in any way, shape, or form. The, um, they were a part of the Nazi war machine. They were created by the Nazi war machine, funded by them, recruited by them. The church, the Catholic, Ukrainian Catholics recruited for them as well. For the Waffen SS, but uh, and the uh, Ukrainian nationalists on the ground recruited for the, or some of them recruited for the Waffen SS, but they they were not fighting for Ukrainian independence when they uh, joined. They uh, they were like you said volunteers. I think there were eighty thousand of them, but many more uh, tried to volunteer. But you know the Nazis picked the best eighty thousand. Um, uh, they were. Uh, they were not struggling for Ukrainian independence. They were struggling. They, they, their pledge of allegiance was a religious oath to fight to the death for Hitler. That's what was the wording of it. it and it was religious. There was God in there. They were fighting to the death for Hitler. And uh, this was not fighting for Ukrainian independence. In fact, the Waffen-SS Galicia, this Ukrainian 
uh, Waffen SS, uh, which was part of the Nazi war machine, uh, they were not just fighting in Ukraine. They were sent around to different places in Europe to fight for the Nazi cause that had nothing to do with Ukraine. They fought in Yugoslavia against partisans there. They fought in Slovakia against partisans there who were supporting the, the Soviets. So they were, and they were killing civilians and partisans, and they were um, doing what the, they were under the command of Heinrich Himmler. You know, these, this is not some independence movement. Who's considered the, uh, architect, of the, Ukrainians. Architect, the, the architect of the Nazi Holocaust against Jews. Were. Yeah, Himmler was their commander in chief. He was the commander in chief of the Waffen SS militia. And there's there's photos you can find online if you just uh, just Google Himmler and uh, Waffen SS Galician, uh, or probably just Himmler Ukrainian will give you these photos where he, he's going to visit the troops. But the the point is they were not fighting for Ukrainian independence. Now the, the um, so the uh, when they came to Canada, so two thousand veterans of the Waffen SS Galicia were welcomed into Canada. Canada wanted them here, even though uh, Canada had refused the entry of Jews and was still refusing the entry of communists and did not want Jews and communists in, to come to Canada. They turned them away when they were trying to flee from the, from the Nazis. Uh, but they welcomed 2,000 uh, members of the Waffen SS Galicia. Um, right after the war in the uh, early 50s, late 40s. They also welcomed about 2,000 veterans of the Banderite army. So you have to understand that there were several different armies that the Ukrainian fascists created. There was the Waffen SS Galicia that they, that they helped to promote, and they, uh, there was a split in the organization of Ukrainian nationalists in 1940. So this was the fascist uh, movement uh, in, in uh, Ukraine, of Ukrainian uh, nationalists. And they had a huge split. And the dominant force uh, uh, emerged uh, under the leadership of Stepan Bandera. But there was a, another side of the split was under the leadership of a guy named Melnik. And, um, Anyway, the Melnik, the Melnikites, <laughs> the organization of Ukrainian nationalists who were part of his uh, side of the split, uh, they were considered by the Nazis to be more compliant, to be more, uh, a better match for them. They uh, used them uh, to uh, coordinate the entire collaboration. So the Ukrainian fascists and the uh, were um, uh, were split between the two. The Nazis saw the OUNM under the Melnikites as a more reliable partner to coordinate the collaboration with the Nazis. The Banderites were considered a little bit more uh, difficult to work with for the Nazis because they were more, more strident about their demand for an independent state. So when they so the but the Banderites still collaborated with the Nazis at the beginning of the war, in the invasion, Operation Barbarossa, when the Nazis invaded, the Banderites helped form uh, military units that marched in, and then as soon as they got in, then they declared independence, and this surprised and outraged the Nazis, and so for a period in the, in the middle of the war, the Banderites sort of fell out of favor with the Nazis, but the Banderites did not even want people, their fellow Ukrainian fascists to join with the Waffen SS because they wanted everybody to join their army, the Ukrainian insurgent army. Anyway, so there's this, all this complicated stuff. And then at the end, uh, towards the end of the war, after the fall of Stal uh, after Stalingrad was liberated and the Nazis were defeated in Stalingrad, that was a turning point in the war. And the Rus the, the Russian, the, the Soviet uh, uh, Red Army started to drive the Nazis back to Germany and they pushed them back. And at that point, the Nazis thought, we need more support from East European fascists. We're gonna give them more power. And they recruited the Ukrainian fascists under Bandera 
to pull together all these different uh, fascist armies from all over Eastern Europe. There were about 20 different fascist armies uh, that came together under the umbrella, under the leadership of the Ukrainian fascists to help the Nazis uh, as they were retreating from the Soviet Red Army as it was driving them back and the war was ending. And then after the war, the Banderites continued to fight terrorists uh, to strike at the Soviet Union and killed, they say they killed tens of thousands of Soviets after the war. They kept fighting after the war up until about 1960. They were still, until they were finally put down, these terrorists inside of the Soviet Union. And, and but so, anyway, so, yeah, yeah, go so, ahead. So Canada, Canada brings in uh, 2,000 of the, uh, the Waffen-SS, uh, a couple thousand of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, the Banderites. Yeah, the Banderites, the Banderite faction, yeah. Banderite faction, and, and other, and other. Uh, and the uh, other military units as well, yeah. So I don't know how many, but maybe there were 5,000 uh, veterans, uh, fascist veterans of Ukrainian ethnic well, origins that were brought into Canada, plus their families. I, there were like several hundred thousand. I think it, I'm not sure, but I think it might have maybe doubled the population of Ukrainians. Now, the Ukrainians that were already in Canada that had come in previous waves of immigration were quite left wing. They were, uh, they formed about a third of the Communist Party in Canada. You know, were the Ukrainians of this or of these earlier generations of Ukrainians, and so the Canadian government, which was really right wing, especially Mackenzie King, my God, the guy went to hit uh, went to Germany, met Hitler, and just wrote in his diary about how much he basically just loved Hitler. You know, like he, he, it was like he was in love with Hitler. He thought that Hitler was the the best hope for promoting world peace, and he encouraged Hitler to continue. This was in 1939. You know, he'd already been killing tens of thousands of people, you know, 100,000 people or something. You know, there were all these people in concentration camps uh, that, you know, King and Hitler were both extremely anti-communist. So they saw eye to eye on that. King also went and met Mussolini. But anyway, I don't want to get distracted. The point is that um, these all these uh, Ukrainian uh, fascists, former veterans came over to Canada, were welcomed in here. And then they these uh, fascists, as well as fascists from other parts of Eastern Europe that, that the Canadian government really wanted to have come in because it was the Cold War and everybody was uh, rallying around the struggle to fight uh, the communist threat of the Soviet Union. And basically NATO took over the role that Hitler had played. Hitler was the world's leading anti-communist, right? He was the leader of the whole international movement to destroy communism. And that's why he was supported by the bankers and corporations and everything, big ones, you know, they, they gave him so much money. His little Nazi party was nothing in the twenties. And then it was built up by all these bankers from the United States, from Germany, from elsewhere. Uh, uh, so after the war, Hitler's and the Nazis are a spent force. Who's going to lead the world anti-communist movement? Well, it was the United States and NATO, which and NATO almost immediately brought in Germany, brought in Italy, it brought in Spain. It, you know, uh, all these fascist uh, people were the governments were involved. And then once they were here in Canada, these fascists, the Ukrainians and the other ones from Eastern Europe. They started forming ethnic organizations, associations, to represent their communities. And so they formed uh, these different, uh, and the government funded them. Um, and so we have the UCC, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, which was actually created by the Canadian government in 1940. The Canadian government, because there had been this split within the fascist movement of Ukrainians, the Canadian government thought, gee, we don't wanna have a split amongst these fascists. We need to bring them together to unite the fascist Ukrainians. <laughs> what, a, what a thought, eh? you don't wanna divide the fascists. You wanna bring them together because they can be your helpers and your supporters and your allies in the struggle of the Cold War. So they united the, and, and uh, of World War II. So in 1940, the Canadian government created the, the uh, Ukrainian Canadian Congress. At the same time, in 1940, in over in Europe, 
The Nazis created another organization called, which had the same acronym, the UCC, but it wasn't Ukrainian Canadian Congress, of course. It was the Ukrainian, uh, uh, what was it? Ukrainian Coordinating Committee. So, it, and it was uh, the led by the Melnikites, the Melnikite faction, which then created the Waffen SS, and they were based in Krakow, and it was that uh, organization, the UCC in Krakow, German-occupied uh, Poland, that Christian Freeland's grandfather worked for. He worked for the UCC in Krakow, and he was the chief propagandist for that for that uh, network, that coalition of fascists under the leadership of the Melnikites that the Nazis picked as their as their reliable partners uh, to coordinate the, the all the work that was done because the Ukrainian fascists were of great help to the Nazis, of course. But anyway, I think the main thing, and I, I keep getting distracted by all these little details, but the main thing that I think is so important that is being ignored is that the, uh, the Canadian government has been funding millions of dollars to these Ukrainian uh organizations in canada that still glorify their uh their founders their heroes their freedom fighters you know they these are they welcomed hitler and the nazis as a liberating force because they were so anti-communist Anyway, I should let you. <laughs> and no, I mean, so 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 that gets me to uh, another question: is that to 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 hone in as much on the the foreign policy element because there there's you know I think a fair bit of discussion about how these right wing Ukrainian forces they were brought into Canada they then would like they even blew up like temp a temple from the a labor temple from left wing yep. uh, Ukrainian yep. and they really work to like undermine divide and and you know like actual sort of like acts of terror against yeah. uh, left, -wing, left wing Ukraine. So that's sort of, I think, been discussed a little bit. If you if you can discuss a bit more about that. But but I also then want, but want on the on the more sort of foreign policy element is that these these um, far right Ukrainian and other Eastern European uh, groups. Now, they, it was very obvious that pushing nationalism in, in during the US time of the USSR in Ukraine was a way to weaken the USSR. Um, but but what you see also going on even after the USSR uh, dissolves is they these forces you know they continue Canadian support for these forces as part of a geopolitical struggle to sort of weaken uh, weaken Russia. So so if you can I maybe mean, mention a little bit about you know some of the sort of undermining of the left uh, in Canada, but then also kind of how you see it within that kind of broader foreign policy even post. Uh, USSR uh, kind of time. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, so why the question is really uh, the underlying question uh, is why did Canada bring all these fascists over to Canada? And so one one part of the answer to that is what you say that the is it, and what I kind of hinted at earlier uh, is that the Ukrainian Canadian community in Canada before the World War II was quite left wing. It wasn't just a little bit left wing. It, you know, it had socialists and it had social democrats, but it also had a lot of communists in it. And right from the World War, uh, right from the Russian Revolution in 1917, the Ukrainian Canadian community was quite was really split between these left wing uh, Ukrainians who were who were atheists, who were uh, fighting for in unions they were involved in unions and in all sorts of progressive struggles way back like more than 100 years ago it's an incredible history very interesting and they the, this uh, the left-wing ukrainian community still exists but it's been unfortunately it's been really overwhelmed and dominated you know squashed uh, and there were even acts of terror by the ukrainian fascist types who came over here they did bomb well it's not, I don't think it's really been proven that they bombed that uh, uh, left-wing Ukrainian uh, community center, which they called labor temples. Uh, but it's pretty clear that they, they must have been involved. They were probably the ones that did it. Um, 
So the Canadian government brought over these right-wing Ukrainians in order to squash the Ukrainian leftist community that was already here, that was causing trouble for the Canadian government. Because uh, the Canadian government was actually quite worried back in the, uh, around the time of the Russian Revolution. They were worried about a revolution in Canada. They actually rounded up thousands of East Europeans, mostly Ukrainians, in uh, in the World War One, starting in uh, 1914, but they kept them in prison and imprisoned in concentration camps. That's what the government called them, concentration camps. They kept these Ukrainians in these concentration camps up until 1921. Well, the World War One was over by then, uh, but they kept them in these concentration camps where they forced them uh, forced. They were basically they were just slaves. They were forced to do labor. Uh, um, but the, most of those Ukrainians were left-wing Ukrainians. Anyway, so they wanted to squat because the Canadian government was really worried, and you can see this in the correspondence between the top military and political leaders at the time, they were, uh, they were uh, worried and they were saying, you know, we have to watch out for these, these guys because they might be the, the uh, they might cause a revolution here in Canada. So, they needed to, that's the, on the domestic front, the purpose of, of uh, this huge influx and deliberately bringing on, in all of these uh, uh, really right-wing uh, people was to squash the, uh, the left-wing uh, Ukrainian community. On the foreign policy front, as I said, you know, earlier uh, hinted at, there was that the, it's a Cold War thing. It was so uh, driven by anti-communism and the Ukrainian uh, right wing was seen as a very valuable tool, a proxy that could be uh, used to help divide and conquer the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was the main enemy of Hitler, uh, and it became the main enemy of NATO. So because NATO and the U.S. led NATO took over the role that Hitler had of being the world's leading anti-communist force. And so after World War II, they saw the Ukrainian uh, nationalists, the far right ones that had supported Hitler, they saw them as a useful tool for uh, uh, for causing trouble, for destabilizing, for kind of uh, spreading propaganda uh, in the Soviet Union to try to bring it down. They wanted to destroy the Soviet Union. And, they, and, and so they, they used the Ukrainians as a tool. And just to just jump in there, let you go further out here. The Royal uh, Radio Canada International sets up like a Ukrainian section in, I think, 1950 to pump in sort of, you know, pro-Canada, pro-NATO, anti-USSR uh, radio into, into Ukraine. And they set up other ones for other Eastern European, uh, you know, Warsaw Pact countries as well during that. Yeah, that. But yeah so continue. Yeah, that's, 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 that's absolutely true. The CBC International service was uh, complicit in a massive propaganda program to try to destabilize the Soviet Union. They were beaming in radio broadcasts there and they, uh, same with the United States was doing the same thing. And uh, they, um, their goal was to, uh, to use the Ukrainians as, uh, as a way of sort of dividing and conquering the Soviet Union, which was their main objective. Yeah. Um, the so, uh, yeah. Go ahead. So yeah. So taking it up a bit more until today, sort of like you know, like Christian Freeland. I should add to that. Christian Freeland, in the late nineteen eighties. She goes there. She's clearly involved in efforts by you know Ukrainian nationalists to break to divide, break up the Soviet Union. So that we know that's going on. Uh, you know, through the nineteen eighties. But then even after USSR dissolves. Um, these forces really become turned on Russia, right? So, so to me, like it, it's not just an anti-left wing and anti-US, anti-communist, anti-USSR thing, and it clearly is that, but it's also kind of part of a broader historic geopolitical battle with, you know, the Russian Empire and and Canada, you know, in the eighteen fifties, Canada Canadians go fight with the British in Crimea. Um, uh, against Russia, uh, you know, Canada invades Russia in 1917, 6,000 Canadians invade Russia. Uh, and that's partly anti-communist, I think, 
you know, partly about World War One and partly partly anti-Bolshevik. Um, but 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 they continue to push the sort of right wing nationalism, I think, right into today across Eastern Europe. Canada continues to push that as part of a battle with Russia that's now no longer, you know, Russia is now oligarchic. It's no longer, you know, socialistic. It's it's um, um, and so any you know, further insight into that uh, kind of dynamic? Uh, yeah, something to add to that is a, a different a different way of looking at it a bit. OK, so. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Russia is not a communist country. It's not a socialist country, although they, they have socialized medicine. You know, they're more socialist than the U.S. <laughs> you know, they have um, state owned, uh, uh, you know, state owned businesses and stuff more than the U.S. does. Probably, they're, they're not probably. as privatized. But the main thing, I, and, uh, the main thing, though, that I think you have, you have to remember is two things. One, the two, th two things would be that there is a, a big communist movement in the in Russia even today. Like the the second biggest party is the Communist Party. Can you imagine that in Canada? The Communist Party doesn't even have any MPs. Over in in the in Russia today, they have the second largest number of of members of their parliament. Right? They're communists. Okay, so that's one thing to consider. So in the future. 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, maybe that communist party will, will become the, the uh, ruling party of Russia. It's possible because they're the, the, the I mean, the, the uh, Putin's party uh, has a super majority. Like it, it's, it's really dominates the political scene there, but the communists are still big. So we have to keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that because the Russians lost so many millions of people fighting the Nazis. This is, and they, uh, they were the biggest victims of the Nazis. And because they were the victors over the Nazis, they really led the destruction of the Nazis, right, in the Second World War. There's a huge part of the Russian identity that is tied up in a very pro-communist mentality because they look back on their history of having defeated the Nazis and having been the main victim of the Nazis, they see that as a very central part of their whole national identity. This is a huge part of, of who they are, who they how they think of themselves. Like you, you, you think about Canadian national identity, you know, what is the what are the key things that we have? Well, you know. I don't want to go there. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's important. So yeah, it's true. Russia is a capitalist country. It's more of a uh, a competitor with the United States and with NATO countries. But it has that huge history of uh, behind it, and it still that reflects in the in their uh, elections in the sense that the communists are still a force within that country. So I can so you have to see that that Russia is a threat to the West because of those things. It's not uh, you know you can't just now separate Russia from their history and from the from communism. It's still a big factor in their identity and in their politics, their electoral politics. Yeah, I, I see it. I mean, I, I agree with you that that should be considered. But I see it as the U.S., any state that whatever its social relations internally, that is a powerful state. And clearly, Russia is because it's, you know, the biggest state um, and it has had a strong military. Uh, any state that that puts up any, um, you know, challenge to U.S. power, the U.S. is going to try to weaken. And so so uh, whether that's China, whether that's um, Russia and and then right now we're, you know, we've been willing to U.S. has been willing to strengthen India to challenge China. But if India gets strong enough, then the U.S. will, will want to weaken India because to to you know rule the world you obviously just don't want any uh any uh, competitor especially a competitor that won't you know follow the orders and clearly 
uh, Putin hasn't followed the orders when, with regards to Syria, with regards to other some other uh, Ukraine and you know going back to 2014 Ukraine and others. But but so um, yeah, so there's like a bigger picture kind of geopolitics that um, is driving a lot of this. But but um, I want to uh, thank you a lot for this very insightful background that we are not getting. Uh, we've probably in the past uh, few days we've seen. Hundreds, literally internationally, this is an international, uh, the parliament's Nazi gate is an international uh, leading news item. And there have been hundreds and hundreds of articles, uh, most of them with very limited uh, uh, background. Um, and you've provided some very uh, uh, important background. Um, I just want to point out to people um, that uh, Richard has, um, alongside his, his wonderful report that people should take a look at, it's on the website, I believe in, in full, um, uh, people should also sign a petition that he launched back in, uh, I think, late uh, 2021, uh, titled Stop Canadian Government Funding of Groups that Glorify Nazi Collaborators. So this was before Russia's invasion. This is not something that just began after Russia's invasion. This is something that has been understood. There's a major issue in Kane politics. Richard has been on this issue, uh, you know, not just in the last four or five days, but going back uh, uh, multiple years. And this is some very deep, uh, deep research. So I do invite people to sign the petition, uh, to check out the report. And again, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Richard. Uh, thanks for coming on. Good, thank you.